Spirit will breathe upon this word and will interpret this word to our hearts. And afterwards, may we be tremendously blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Our lesson this morning is from page 247. It's lesson 674. And the title is Total Freedom from Sin. And our memory verse is 1 John chapter 3 verse 9 it says whosoever is born of god doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of god can we recite that together after the count of two one two whosoever is born of god doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of god first john chapter 3 verse nine our text is taken from first john chapter three from verse one to ten can we have someone please read for us from verse one to ten someone that is really fast because we have just 25 minutes for this lesson anyone please thank you one to ten first john chapter three Yes, please. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteous is righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous he that committed sin is of the devil for the for the devil sinner from the beginning for this purpose the son of god was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil whosoever is born of god does not commit sin for for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of god in in this the children of god are manifest and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth, do, uh, whosoever doth not, I don't, know, whosoever doeth not righteous is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Thank you very much. John the beloved from our text, he celebrates the glorious freedom that every one of us enjoys when we become saved in Christ. And it kind of amazes John that a God who is holy would consider man who is, you know, sinful and everything that man deserves is death, perpetual eternal death in hell. And so he opens the, you know, the narrative in chapter three and says, behold, what manner of love is considering it. This is very, very serious. This is not something that is cheap. This is not something that, you know, we could just walk by the way and just pick it up somewhere. He says, what manner of love is this? What kind of love is this? That God has decided to, you know, look from his holy, you know, throne and consider man that is so dirty and full of sin and trespasses. And then he decides to, to call us his children he decides to call us sons and daughters you know uh, of himself and then he goes further to say that those who are called of god cannot commit sin because they have the nature of god the very nature of god they look like christ they they have the uh, the, the personification of christ in them and because of this they cannot do anything that's righteous and so because of this i mean based upon this uh, rather john uh, the beloved disproved people of his days people of his times who were saying teaching something different 
and they were trying to give an excuse for people who said that they knew they knew the Lord, but then their their conduct did not really portray, you know, the testimony that they were proclaiming. And so uh, he goes further to show us that uh, uh, because of this love, you know, that God had for man, Jesus Christ the Son accepted his his own verdict of the death penalty, so that you can be saved and I can be saved. They decided that well. If I have to die for these people to bring them back to you, God the Father, then I will die for them. And, and that's why uh, John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world knows us not, because it did not know him. Because we are now called children of God, because we, have now, we are now associating with the Father, the world does not know us anymore. We become strangers in this world because we have a very different nature. Let's go to our point one because of time. Point one says transformation through God's love. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, where we read, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children, the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not beloved. Now are we the sons of God or the children of God, and it doth, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that has this hope in him, in her, purifies himself even as Christ is pure. What does that tell us? That there is a character that, uh, you know, that a child of God needs to have. A child of God has to be pure. You know, uh, and, and John shows us something here that uh, a sinner cannot be, be a saint. A sinner is not a saint. A saint is not a sinner. So you have two kinds of people. You have those who are sinners. You have those who are children of God. The people who are committing sin cannot be called children of God because they are sinners. And so uh, it says in uh, John chapter 3 verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ suffered, he died, he rose again to forgive and cleanse and save every sinner from sin and make him a child of God. This glorious transformation uh, that God does in the lives of people does not come by wishful thinking. You cannot just think it up and say, well, I think I'm a Christian, I think I'm holy, I think I'm right righteous. No, it only happens when a sinner acknowledges that he or she is a sinner and then they accept the great love and the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary and then they pray for the forgiveness and the cleansing of sin and believe in the shed blood, the sacrifice that Jesus Christ uh, made on the cross of Calvary. That's how they become children of God. And when they accept this sacrifice, the Bible says in John 1.12 that but as many as received him to them gave he power, authority to become the children of God. When a person says that they have accepted Christ, they have, you know, they have given up sins and all the trespasses. God gives them the power that they can, they will not go back to sin. The spirit of God possesses them. And they now because they now bear the nature of Christ, they are able to live for the Lord. They are able to stand for him. A Christian cannot be a Christian at the same time be in sin. You have nothing to do with sin. So everyone who repents of his or her sin, he receives Christ by faith and is set free from sin and given the power to live a new life in righteousness so let's get it very clear at the point of repentance there's a change that of course there's a turning around repentance is a 360 degrees turnaround it's not 180 it's not 90 degrees repentance is not uh, you know there are people who say um i'm progressing yesterday i was uh, you know it was just three cigarettes today is just one or yesterday i used to have four girlfriends today i just have one girlfriend there's no such thing or yesterday you know i would if, if anybody made me angry i'd go into a very boisterous you know mode and begin to fight but now i just only cuss them there's no such thing when repentance happens everything that is you know uh, of the world everything that is of the devil the sinful nature completely dies and we're giving the power to please God, the part to live for him. Our point number two says distinguishing marks of God's children. What is the major uh, identifying mark of a child of God? It's total freedom from sin. A person who is completely, I mean, who is a child of God is completely free from sin. 
like I said before, you have no business, you know, being in church or being a child of God and still committing sin. You have no business, you know, proclaiming the Lord and dining at the Lord's table and dining with devils. It's not possible. Many religious people today, they do not have the, the assurance of total freedom from sin. There are some of them who, they, you know, they, they use uh, Bible verses to kind of excuse themselves. They say, if the Lord will uh, number iniquity, who can stand? And blah, blah, blah. And they make all these claims just to make people comfortable. So if there are people who are adulterous in their church, if there are people who are committing fornication, if there are people who are stealing and, you know, in fraud and all that nonsense, they feel very okay because, well, there is nobody who can be holy. There is no one who can be perfect. And we are all trying, we are all striving. And as long as we live here, we can never be holy as God. We can never be like Him. We de de you must have some sin. And I, you know, and sometimes people will ask you if you, you know, go, if you do evangelism, they'll ask you and say, can you tell me that since Monday to today, Saturday, you have not told a lie? And the answer is yes. If you have the nature of God and you have the spirit of God in you, the Bible says He gives you the power to become a child of God. He gives you the authority. To become a child of God and you cannot sin because the nature of God is in you so let's get that very straight and um, and uh, you know because of this uh, most people cannot boldly declare with other children of God that be, be, behold now I'm a child of God and incidentally it is this uh, uh, assurance that births the hope of seeing Jesus Christ at his coming so we know that the Bible says we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him we don't yet know what he you know he looks like but we know that when jesus christ appears because he is pure because he's holy we will definitely be like him assurance of salvation is a function of faith in god if you a person sometimes people ask and say well how do you know that you're saved because i have faith in the work that jesus christ has done on the cross of calvary i have faith in the word of god that says that when you come to him he gives you the authority he gives you the ability and you cannot go back to sin because you have his very nature the Bible says without faith is impossible to please God. Those who come to God must come to Him in faith, believing. That's the first thing. You have to be able to believe that He has the power to do whatsoever He says. He cannot lie because He is a just God. We know this from His word, not from our feelings or from the whispers of the devil, the liar who seeks to confuse us. Some people say, I just feel. I just have a feeling. And your heart can tell you lies. I was preaching to a lady before I came to this country she happened to be a white lady and you know something there's something about these white people because you're black they think that there is this innate thing in them that they're born with they think that because you're black you have no you have nothing to tell them that you know they don't already know they, they put them themselves in this position as if oh we're better than those people down there and don't forget this was the same attitude that the jews had to the samaritans they considered the samaritans as lesser than them because they saw them as outcasts they saw them as people that were not pure, you know, Jewish blood. And sometimes when you go out to witness and you meet these white people and you try to talk to them, some of them, we, they, they, they start to talk about science, start to talk about mystic, mystical things and all this rubbish. And uh, if you're not really grounded upon the word of God, or if you yourself don't have the kind of faith that the Bible talks about, the faith in Christ that believes in the authority of scripture and the authority of the Holy Spirit in your life, they're just going to flow you and i was talking to this girl and uh, i was asking her are you born again and she said i don't need to be born again i said well why she said because when i was young my parents used to force me to go to church and now i'm old enough and i can think for myself i don't need to believe all that and i because no she said because my my heart cannot be wrong and i asked her who is in your heart because there has to be someone in your heart because of yourself you can do nothing by yourself at your best you will only produce something that is way lesser than sand, than a grain of sand. But if you have Jesus Christ in your heart, if you have the hope of it, it, eternal life in your heart, you cannot be wrong. Because you have God's leading, you have the backing of the Holy Spirit, and you will be able to please God. And she, she was dumbfounded. She was looking at me. And she said, so what, what am I talking about? I said, well, that's the question. You need to give your life to the Lord. You see? And so... Uh, this is this is what this is why there is some uh, you know Christian so-called Christian assemblies. You go there and if you ask people, are you born again? They really cannot tell you anything. They have no testimony because uh, they are not they are not taught that a person who comes to the Lord 
uh, you know, and believes in the in uh, the death of Jesus Christ, believes in his power to save, will, will ha also have the power not to be able to go back to sin. They believe that as long as we're here in flesh, you know, we're weak, we're always weak, and God understands our weakness, and that they give excuse for, you know, sins that they commit. But the Bible says something totally different. God sends the spirit of his son into your heart, into my heart, into the heart of everyone who is converted to assure him or her that they are children of God once they become born again. Those who do not have this initial deposit of the Spirit of God that bears witness with their spirit that they are the child of, of child or children of God do not belong to Christ. By this operation, the believer who is set free from sin hungers to know more of the Lord through regular fellowship and attendance, constant reading, studying, or listening to the Word of God. If you're really genuinely born again, genuinely saved, one other proof that you know you will have is you will love to fellowship with other brethren. You want to be in attendance, in fellowship, constant reading and studying of the word. You just have a hunger. You know, you, you the spirit of God will be pushing you to his word, pushing you to pray. There are times when maybe you're on the street, maybe you're, you know, commuting in the city, you're in the city bus or you're driving, the, and the spirit of God comes heavy on you and says, I want you to pray right now. And right there on the steering wheel, you're praying. And the Lord puts a burden in your heart, say, pray for these people, pray for that person, pray for that pastor, pray, you know, and just like that. And sometimes the Spirit of God will drive you to a scripture verse, says, go read that scripture verse, and the Lord will be speaking to you from there. Those are things that you find in the heart of a believer. A person who is never happy when you talk about coming to church, I don't want to go to that church. And they have animosity and grievance towards somebody too because somebody says something some time ago because somebody did something you know some time ago and they're still nursing that thing those people are not born again they don't have the same spirit of god that you have in you i have in me and you know the same testimony that we have they don't have it if you can still you know have grudges towards your pastor you still have grudges towards a brother in the church because they said this because they did this and you say you're a Christian, well, the Bible says something totally different. If you are born of God, you cannot commit sin. Malice, animosity, grudge, and all those rubbish, they're not found in the kingdom. They're not found in the, in the Christian life. When the Spirit of God possesses you, the, the fruit of the Spirit, they're the very things that your life will demonstrate. If you have no love for the Bible, you have no love for prayer, you cannot find time to sit down and read your Bible. You cannot find time to kneel down and pray. You cannot find time. It's only when we come to church. And it costs you so much to open your Bible. It costs you so much to pray. When it's time to pray, you just stay there, you know, like, like, a, like a statue. You don't pray. You don't read your Bible. How can you convince us that you're born again? How can you convince us that your testimony is genuine? Because it, the life of Christ is a radiant, vibrant life. The Christian life is an active life. It's not a, It's not just profession. It's not just profession by mouth. It's a. It's an active life. It's a life that anybody who sees you, they see the expression, the definition of redemption in Christ. So God does not have any sinning child. You have to be very sure about that. Those who are not free from sin are not children of God. Now, in the days of John the Beloved, there were people called the Gnostics, and these are people who taught that you know your conduct doesn't matter. It's not important. You know, because what the Gnostics teach is that the body and the soul are separate. And so whatever you do in the body, it doesn't matter. If you go out and you commit fornication, it doesn't matter because the body is inherently bad. It's innately bad. And so the spirit is what matters. And, you know, this is the kind of teaching that most assemblies today, they dwell upon. And you go there and they tell you, well, David did this, Abraham did this. and blah. They never talk about Jesus Christ. And Paul the Apostle said, be followers of me as, an, as I am a follower of Jesus Christ. He's the perfect example. The Bible calls him the author and the finisher of our faith. The flaws of a man somewhere, the flaws of a woman somewhere, are not your perfect example. Your perfect example is Jesus Christ because he went to the cross and died for you. His blood is the blood on which the very testament, the New Testament, is found upon. So, uh, like I said, there are modern day Gnostics today, preachers who tell you that, you know, you can just live how you please, you can dress how you please, ladies can come to the church and their bodies are exposed, they can come with all the tight dresses and, you know, their body anatomy is exposed. You know, uh, when I was back in Tanzania, before I came here, we had this young boy who came to church, he, he, just, got, he, just, he just got born again, and he came to church and uh, we invited him to deeper life. He was going to some church some time ago, and we invited him to a church. And after the service, I called him together with some brethren, and we asked him, well, how did you see the service today? He said, wow, for the first time ever, 
I was able to come to church and sit down and listen and not be distracted. I, I wasn't distracted in my body. And we asked him, what do you mean? He said, you know, there's a place I used to go to before. And the same thing I used to see in the club is what I was seeing in the church. And when they say to pray and all these girls are bending down, you can see their backs and see their underwear. And when they say we should praise and worship and the way they're dancing, and you just become so distracted. And you're looking at a woman's body right in the church. And this boy was not born again then, but he was thinking to himself, if this is a church, this should be an holy place. This kind of a thing should not be happening. Guess what? When the judgment of God comes, those of us who are in church, who decide that, you know, well, we, we are going to use this, you know, gospel as a liberty to sin, we have a lot to answer before the Lord. Because we are supposed to be the light of the world, we are supposed to be the people pointing people to Christ. And if our lives are distracting people, if our lives is drawing people to our body as a female, as a female, there is, no, there is no way that you can convince any true believer, not myself, not any other true Christian true believer, that you are definitely born again and your dressing draws people to your, to your flesh, draws people to you. If a man looks at you and is lusting after you because your clothes are hugging your body or your skirt is so short that you sit down, your laps are visible, or you cannot bend down without, you know, people say what they're not supposed to see. You have questions to answer. You need to go back to the cross. And ask the Lord to deal with you. Your life should draw people to Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. And this is the doctrine that we believe in. Loose living encouraged by the doctrine of eternal security of believers is the bane of present day Christianity. Look at this culture. Look at what is going on. Go to most churches. There is, there is such filth in the churches from the pulpit to the pew. Filth. Pastor in sin. Pew in sin. Everybody in sin. Lost in sin because of the doctrine of loose living but thank god for this church that we stand upon the truth and this truth is what we believe and we practice our last point says the purpose of christ's sacrifice why did christ come to die the, the christ is pure as we see from the bible and in him is no sin and he is righteous the uniform testimony of scripture you look from genesis to revelation he says that jesus lived a sinless life there was no sin found in him and at one point he asked his critics a question. He said, which of you can convince me of sin? Nobody, none of them. They couldn't point to him and say, this is what you did. This is what you did at such a time, at such a time, at such a, at such a point in time. And you know, as a believer, if you say you are genuinely born again, in your school, people should be able to say, I know this girl. She, she lives a pure life. I know this boy. He lives a pure life. In your office, where you are working, women should be able to say i know him it's not a man that you know you can just go to him and you are careless and you are just touching him anyhow if you are a woman men should be able to say i know this woman this woman is pure she's not somebody that you just go to and you are playing carelessly you have to have a testimony that is sound because it is this testimony that will draw people to the lord believers are saved to pattern their lives after christ who is their perfect example you are safe to do righteousness i'm safe to do righteousness and a true child of God cannot touch sin on any ground. Let that be imprinted in your court today. Anything that is sin, a little lie here, a little lie there, a little, you know, sexting here, a little sexting there, using some cuss word here. There was a time I heard one of our young people, he was saying something and he said, he used a word. That, that's a very derogatory, you know, word in the world. That's something they use. It's a cuss word. And he was saying that. And in my spirit, I said, can this boy really be saved? Because those are things that get taken care of at salvation. And you see, brethren, we need to be paying attention because the end is coming. Christ is going to come very soon. There are some, there are some kind of teaching that is creeping into Christian circles. You have to keep your eyes open. Those of you who are parents, watch over your children. If you sometimes sit down with them, check, take stock of their testimony. Are these kids really born again? Sometimes you, sometimes you, the, the song that we were in Minnesota one time. And right there inside the church where they were serving food, this young boy was playing rap music. Nobody was talking. I called him. I said, come, please. This is a church. You cannot be playing that music here. If you have a gun, shoot me to death. But this is the truth. Stop that thing you're doing. Jesus is not happy. Don't do that here. And then the sister by me said, you see, we have been telling you this. I said, no. You should have told him. Don't, don't piggy bank off what I'm doing. You can't, we can't be leaving these people to go to hell. Brethren, let's stand up and serve the Lord. Christ was manifested to take away our sins, and not only our outward sins, but our inbred sin. Secret sin, 
outward sin, Jesus Christ died to take those away. Doing good works, loving your brother with uninterrupted pure motive can only happen when you are sanctified. Holiness and righteousness inside of you, implanted by the very nature of righteousness, is what will make you to obey and love the Lord perfectly. Christ says that the pure in heart are blessed because they are the only ones that can see God. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Guess what? If you are not pure in heart, that means that you cannot see God. If I am not pure in heart, that means that I cannot see God. That should tell you something, brethren. Sanctification is very, very paramount. Sanctification is premier to your seeing God. If you are not sanctified, there is no way that you can see God. I dare to say that because that's the truth of God's word. Go, go to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Jesus Christ said, blessed are the pure in heart. If you are not sanctified, there is no heaven for you because you cannot please because the very nature of Christ does not possess you and you cannot please God 100% if you're not sanctified you things like sometimes you're going to have things like anger the, you know this this unholy anger that when a minister comes and he tells you he points your sin to you you become so angry and you are your body is vibrating it's like if, if I don't destroy something I'm not going to be okay there is no heaven for you sir there's no heaven for you ma'am if you're here and your parents talk to you and you are borrowing something from this culture, you talk back at them. They talk to you and you, they, they say one word and you have five words for them. If you are living in this culture, you begin to copy the people of the land. They are dressing. The way they talk to adults, the way they talk to older people, the way they disrespect adults because they think, oh, I have my rights and I can exercise my rights. You can't do me anything. Hellfire is waiting for you. I dare to tell you that. Hellfire is waiting for you. If the rapture should occur right now, you are not sanctified. I am not sanctified. We cannot see God. Because that's what the Bible says. It says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. If you are not pure in heart, you are not going to heaven. So have it at the back of your mind today. And if you are not sanctified, you can be sanctified today. This is the word of God. You, you can come to the Lord and say, Lord, something is wrong with me. Something is wrong with my heart. I'm not okay. You need, to, you need to cleanse me. You need to, it's not by raising up your hand. You can raise up your hand and still go back to sin. Those things that you do in secret, those things that you do in the, in the secrecy of your mind, the grudge that you have against your parents, the grudge that you have against church leadership, the disrespect that you show every time you disrespect your parents because you think they're not as educated as you are, you disrespect your parents because you think all these my African parents, they don't have any understanding, you call your parents mules. Because you think that you are now in America, you've gone to school. Guess what? If the rapture takes place right now, you will bite your finger. You will wish it was steak. You'll not be able to eat it. Let's get it pretty clear. There's no impurity that will enter heaven. Outward sin, inward sin, no going to heaven. And God has such a holy intelligence that he can decode actions and motives. Anything behind them, anything that you're doing, God can decode it. He knows why you're doing that thing. And even if you say, well, that's not what I mean. God searches the hearts. The Bible says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And he searches the inward parts of man. So the very breath in your nostrils, God, that's God's, that's God's, uh, you know, it, that's God's FBI or whatever I will call it. And when he looks at that breath, he knows the very things that are in your heart. He knows why you are walking the way you are walking. Why you, you know, put your, the face, the facial expressions that you show. He knows why you do it. He knows why you, you, that disposition you are showing. He knows why you do it. He knows that you are trying to belittle, you know, parental control. Belittle church leadership. Belittle those people that lead you in church. He knows why you are doing those things. And guess what? If you don't make an amen, if you don't turn around and decide to please the Lord, I'm sorry. But I have to tell you the truth. At the end of time, you have yourself to blame. I pray that the Lord will help us, that the very nature of Christ will possess us and the Lord will give us power. The power to please him here in America, outside of America, in the secret and in the open, in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's close our eyes and pray.